that rain is going to fall and the barren places shall become fruitful and God will be glorified among his people. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. So do not get weary in your well-doing. Hallelujah. Sister Helen dares, what is my sweetheart? She, and look at this. Oh, my, my, my. All of these ones that we have been able to share with over the years and seeing you seek, seeking the Lord and believing the Lord. Don't get weary. God's doing something. Hallelujah. Oh, we're just here just to blend our hearts together because this is a beginning of calling together of those of like precious faith whose hearts are after God. I was with a pastor today, spent some time, first time I ever met him, and uh, he saw something, he said the Lord gave him, which is a good sign. He saw beautiful water, body of water, but it was all damned and nothing flowing over. And on the other side, it was barrenness. But then he saw in the spirit that he was helping to remove, you know, like, um, uh, what are those animals that beaver dams? Yeah, they like to plug everything. Well, they did this, and he saw in the spirit, like it was like beaver dams, didn't call it that, but it was like that damming up and that the water that was above could not flow down because it was all plugged, it was dammed up. So uh, he saw in the spirit that they were removing a little bit by little bit and a trickle of water started to flow over. And I said, go for it, brother. Don't leave a bit of the dam there. Take it all out so there will be a gushing of the waters. And I, I encouraged him. And uh, some of you would likely know him but I just got to know him for the first time today. So I believe God is stirring different servants of his and who will hear and hearken to the voice of God, God's going to use. And there's going to be a line drawn, hear it out, and those who are going to pay the price of moving with God and others who will just sit idly by. But I'm not sitting idly by. You say, well, you know, You've served now, it's time to settle back. There's no settling back in the kingdom of God. There's no retirement in the kingdom of God. I'm more excited now than I think I've ever been. When I was over there in Africa, oh, to see what God was doing, the Lord released me. I just was turned loose. They couldn't get over. And the pastor said, how old are you? They wanted to know. They saw the white hair. One little boy said, are you 100? I said, I'm getting close. Uh, they all laughed. And they, uh, but, you know, she wanted to know. I said, well, I'll tell you. This is in front of the whole congregation. I said, I'm the same age as my tongue, a little older than my teeth. And so she wasn't happy with that because she still wanted to know. But, uh, you know, it has nothing to do with age. Moses got going at 80. Yeah. Hallelujah. Caleb took the mountain at 85. So I'm just getting started. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's continue to believe the Lord, for the Lord is going to reward those who've been faithful to him. I heard in my spirit, the Lord said, I am coming and my reward is with me. So he's not just coming, he's got a reward. And for those who are faithful, he's going to reward greatly. So do not be faint of heart. Do not be weary in your well-doing, for the Lord will greatly reward those who press in to that which he is doing, not going to do, he is doing. There is a movement right now. It may be like the pastor saw a little trickle coming over the dam, but they're removing that dam. And this is what we want to do tonight in the spirit, to remove the dam. Are you ready to do it? Yes. We're going to pull away all the debris and all the things that Satan is trying to push against the flow of God. And the Lord has given it to us to remove that in the spirit. So the beautiful, he said, the water was beautiful and crystal clear that was up above, but never meeting the need of that which was below because it was damned. So we're going to break down the barriers and the preparing of the way of the Lord is given to us. And I, I was just sitting there and hearing that. Now, Brother John was so kind, he printed out some of my scripture with big, with big bold letters, so that's good. And... Uh, and I still need glasses, but I, I can do it. Um, brother, could you read? Brother John, come up here for a moment, please. Um, and I've got it marked here in this big print. You can read it. 
I had David here the last time. Okay. Isaiah 40. Can you find that, Isaiah 40? Then we're going to get into some prayer, how to break down barriers and really, no, just the first 40, just down to, um, start here, 3, down to, what, let me see, down to that verse 7, just those 3 to 7. 3 to 7. Yeah, can you hear? Okay. Hear the word of God. Very well. That's it. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and yeah. every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, uh -huh. and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, cried, and he said, what should I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Mm. Surely the people is grass. Yes, stay right there. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. God is giving this command to his people. Now, we can pray all we want and say, Lord, straighten out the path. He said, you straighten out the path. I'm straightening you out, but you straighten out the path. What is going on in your life, in the life of situations? And prepare the way of the Lord for the glory of the Lord to be revealed. That's the purpose. We're preparing our hearts. We're preparing the church. We're preparing God's people to have the glory of God revealed. And tomorrow night, Lord willing, I want to share with you the difference between the power and the glory of God. I shared this in Africa. They ate it up. They said, oh, can we get more? And, and I just kept on, they just drew it out. And when you see the glory of God as it is in the kingdom, you'll never want to be just satisfied with the power. The power is to introduce you to the glory. But most people stay only in the power. And you're going to see what the glory of God really is, how the power of God will take you into the glory of God. God. And we have to prepare the way. Read that part, that first verse. Prepare the way. The verse 3. 3. The voice of him that cries in the well, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Okay. We're getting a highway ready. And this is what we're going to do in the spirit tonight. We're going to pray what things are needing to be removed so we can prepare the way of the Lord. The Lord will not walk a crooked path. He said, make the plain, the, the crooked places plain, straight. Straighten them out. There are a lot of things that need to be straightened out in the church. Come and the on. Rough, and the rough places, plain. And the rough, and how many know there are a lot of rough places? But God is giving us the ability, and we were going to do this tonight. We want to prepare the way of the Lord. I was just sitting there, and the Lord said, read that portion, because this is that which I'm preparing in my people. And so we're just here to help prepare the way of the Lord. I'm so excited. I feel like a little boy in Christmas morning. Hallelujah. How many know there is a holy anticipation that God's birthing within the hearts of his people that we're going to see this mighty thing happen. So there is a movement right now. A voice crying in the wilderness. You've been as a voice crying in this area. And there are those who didn't want to hear it. Uh, how many know John the Baptist wasn't most popular among the religious people? But boy, the hungry people went out miles in the wilderness to hear a word from God. We need a word from God in this province. We need it in the, in the Maritimes. We need it in the nation. God knows we need something as we face an election. This nation has been drained down so quickly. We need a Holy Ghost in uh, work, even in the uh, government of Canada, because there are some things 
that are going on right now, stay close by. I heard a, a lawyer that works for the government spoke to leaders in Toronto. Tears in her eyes. She cannot disclose who she is or she'd lose her job. But she said, I cannot be silent because I know what's going on in this government right now. And if d something doesn't change, she said, if, if it continues, we're going down. The church is going to be squeezed. And there's going to be persecution. Already, it's already, we feel the squeeze. She was so moved, a brilliant young lawyer from Ottawa. And she said, where is the church? She said, I don't hear the church crying out. She said, uh, I heard somebody, a pastor, say, look at all of our children. They're the church of tomorrow. And she said, I wanted to jump to my feet and cry out. They're the prisoners of tomorrow. Unless something changes, they're going to be putting our children into prison because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And the church is asleep. There's no one crying out. Or I shouldn't say no one, but there's no strong voice. But there are voices like this coming together. And so the Lord has used you to be a voice crying, <laughs> crying in the wilderness. When I heard that, I felt a cry way down here. We've got to get some belly spirit cries out to God. None of our sweet talk is going to change. We need to get down before God and pray in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praying in the Holy Ghost. This is a thing we've got to turn the tide. And prayer can do it. We can hold back the powers of darkness and get the glory of God being manifested. It's God's intention to bring back His glory. And this is his, going to be His purpose in, in the nation. So, I'm ready for the glory. Amen. The power alone has not done it, has not met the need. We have people use the power, abuse the power. They get something happening in their lives and, and, uh, and it goes into the flesh. But no flesh can glory in the glory of God. I've seen flesh glory in the power of God. Where they have even used it, they fall down and they're down for a split second, they're back up. But I've never seen... Anybody that had had a visitation of the glory remained the same. Absolutely changed. Never the same again. So I'm here to say it's time for the glory. Nudge your neighbor and say it's time for the glory. Time for the glory. It's time for the glory, brother. Hallelujah. I want the glory of God. This has been, they called me the glory preacher, but I, I want it. We saw, we saw, once you taste the glory, you'll never want to go back to anything else. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you ready for this work of God to be done? Hallelujah. And the low places, the valleys shall be, what is that word? Raised up. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, cried. And he said, what should I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth because the spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Right. Surely the people is grass. Amen. You see, flesh is just grass. And there is so much grass, flesh, in the church today. Let's get real. I'm not judging. I'm just reporting. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Truth. We want, we want real fruit. Like there's nothing to grass only for a short time. It has its purpose. We want the Spirit of God to move and bring forth life. So this is God's desire. And the valley shall be lifted up, and the mountain shall be brought down. In other words, those who have been so down and, and pushed down in society shall be raised up. And those who have been sitting like high level, you got to listen to us, we are whatever, we control the church. God said, I'm going to bring them down and bring them down. And those who are low are going to be raised up. And there's going to be a highway, hallelujah, for everyone to walk. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Hallelujah, Brother Lawrence. Yes, uh, you've been seeing things that are so, uh, Can I get the, such a confirmation to the yeah. things that you ought to show me now. Now, one of the things you said that you were saying about the uh, preparing the way of the Lord. Yeah. 
Well, I had this vision where the Lord was at Pier 21. Now, that could be the Eastern Gate, you see. And the Lord was standing there with his hands open, and behind him was a multitude of angels. And the Lord dropped his arms for a moment. A few angels got in front of him, and he went into Canada. And these angels were called preparatory angels because they were preparing the way of the Lord. Right. When the angels came back, they got behind the Lord, and the Lord dropped his hands, and all of the angels, the multitudes, came into Canada, and a mighty work started to happen. You know what I mean? But yeah. God showed me in that vision. But I saw the Lord at Pier 21 standing there with all these angels behind him. He's about to do something great in this area. And preparing the way of the Lord wow. is very important because these angels were called preparatory angels. They're coming to help to prepare the way of the Lord. Amen. And yeah. I believe that's going to happen. Isn't that great? Now, well, Pier 21 is very, isn't that the big pier where everyone comes into yeah. the country? Comes wow. in to go throughout Canada, yeah, yeah. In, in the trains. In, in the past, they've come from all over the country. Wow. So can you say that again? That, that is so it's significant. Pier 21, pier 21, as I know yeah. that for years, that's been the pier where anyone coming into the nation yeah. came in through Pier 21. Yeah, took the trains. And so Jesus yeah. was standing there. Yeah, and he was holding back the multitude of angels because it wasn't quite time. Uh -huh. But he let his arms down, and a few angels came in front of him, and they went uh, to prepare the way of the Lord. Wow. And I, I, they were like preparatory angels, you know. And they came back, they prepared the way of the Lord, and then they came back, and then they get back in line, and then God dropped his arms, and all the angels came in yeah. through all of Canada, and, and people would be in touch in their homes, in, the, in their cars, walking down the streets, and they didn't even know what was happening. They were coming to Christians and saying, I don't know what happened to me. But we were saying, that we know what happened to you. God touched you. Glory God to God. touched your life, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I want to run. Glory. That's beautiful. Now, here's something that God wants to say, too. Yeah. This move of God is not about all that we might do for God, but all that God's going to do for us. Amen. That's what it's about. That's, it okay. is. Now, I'll leave you with this prophetic word. You talked about the prophetic and the fact that people are going to speak prophetic things, then they're going to come to pass. Yeah. Why does God say that he doesn't do anything until he reveals it to his prophets? Yeah. Because when a great a mighty move of God takes place, no one can say, well, I did it. Yeah. Or it's because of my agenda. God got ahead of you. God said, I'm going to do that. Amen. See? So here's the, here's the, I'll leave you with this word, okay? Love it. And God, and, and God is preparing us because he's going to say things and do them. And this is, this is a word from the Lord in front of a poem. He's saying this, um, This is the day that my spirit will burn in blazing prophecy that all may learn. This is the day the sinner will cry, a time to live, but I must die. A time to be wise and a time to be wary, a time to withdraw to my sanctuary. Oh, <laughs> hallelujah. Oh, I've just been refreshed. Thank you, brother. You know, there's so many God speaking and using in his body but they never have a platform because it, it's controlled religion, yes. controlled Christianity. Yes. It's not body ministry. God's restoring body ministry. And he has gifted people in the, the knowledge, in the way of the Spirit, and he's releasing that back to the body. We have an example of that. You know, most places, I don't know if they even, even allow that time to happen. But because of your sensitivity... And this happening, there's going to be an increase because the, the word is going out. Because those who have an ear to hear, they're going to hear. And it's going to quicken in their spirit. And they said, my God, this is what we've been praying for. This is what we've been longing for. And they're going to respond. And this wave is going to increase until it spreads across the land. Hallelujah. I'm so glad the Lord's keeping me around so I can see it. I've got so many friends, they're all passing off to glory. I said, what are you doing that for? And some of, so many of them have just gone recently, and I'm out of the country. I said, look, if you want me to attend your funeral, don't die while I'm out of country. <laughs> Book it while I'm still around, because uh, I'm not intending to go right now. We've got so much to do. This is the day of the visitation. And Jesus wept over Jerusalem and said, you missed the time of your visitation and the day of your peace. We do not want to miss the time of our visitation. I mean, it's now upon us. Either we can have a choice to move in God or it will go another direction. But as long as you stalwarts 
and people of the faith agree together, God will reward you, and it shall surely come to pass. So we're believing God to uh, continue that which he's begun. So don't be weary in your well-doing. God is on the move. Hallelujah. Some of you old-timers, uh, they call us the white hairs. They said, all you whiteheads. I said, don't say anything against the whiteheads because it's the, been the force that's kept things together. And for the next generation, I see young people here tonight. Wonderful to see you. And the Lord is raising up and quickening in your spirit as well. So it will be no generation gap. You know, they, they have set up generation gap. Now they've got a, a, a new generation, I think Z or Z, we say it. They call it Z generation. I don't know what that means. But they keep putting gaps. But when the Holy Spirit moves, there is no generation gap. There is a flow of God and a oneness has nothing to do with age. So God is quickening and bringing together. There is something that have been latent in, in your spirit and nothing's been happening. The Lord would say, do not be discouraged because the Lord has seen the desire of your heart and there will be a mighty quickening in your spirit and it will be to you like a resurrection. All of a sudden, you will burst forth. You'll say, whoa, where has this come from? There will be such a surge of the power of God. And your spirit will come so alive. And out of this, you will prophesy. You said, I've never prophesied before. The Lord says that all of our sons and daughters shall what? Prophesy. Not just from the pulpit, not just pastors or certain leaders. The spirit of prophecy is about ready to hit the church. And it will not be silenced because there are those like yourselves who are so desperate for God and you're coming together and that word will be exploding within you and there will be this release that will go out like a mighty river. Hallelujah. How many understand what the Spirit is saying? Glory to God. Oh, there is such a working right now. And, and the Lord says, well, tear down the barriers. And what some of those barriers... I had, let me just look at the one thing the Lord made known. Can I go? Uh, not far. Okay, you can. <laughs> you can. Thank you, my precious brother. Oh, you were a great help. Let me, the Lord made known what has been happening. Thank you. One of the greatest forces that we have to deal with, and you're going to respond to this. It would not likely be the first thing you think of, but the Lord says, what is going on in the church today that has not been addressed clearly is the spirit of offense. And I said, oh, the Lord said, but the church is full of offense. Some, you have been offended or others have offended you. And the Lord says, some have taken the offense of others and carried that some for years while others have moved ahead and forgotten that you're carrying somebody else's offense tonight the lord said i want you to deal with offense in prayer and that we're going to break that off of ourselves because we all have been wounded to some degree all of us you can't pass through life without having some offense did not jesus say um it is impossible that no offenses shall come, but woe to him through whom they do come. And that was the verse the Lord gave. Offenses will come. Jesus warned it. But woe unto the one who causes these offenses. They're not going to get away with it. God says there's judgment on them. And we're not talking outside the church. I'm talking inside the church. Where offenses, I have been offended. And to the place where I felt so crushed, I'd never rise again. I thought it was all over. There's no hope. And God had to give a special visitation because they, of the situation. And the Lord said, now, what are you going to deal? How are you going to deal with this? You can go, you make a choice. You can be offended or you can release it. And tonight, I want to make sure that all of us, if we're moving in the way of God to release any offenses, that has come because offense is painful and don't worry about the ones who causes the offense God said I'll deal with them woe to them but don't carry any offense 
because it has been one of the biggest stumbling blocks to the move of the Holy Spirit. So if we tonight can deal with offenses that have happened to us or even offenses that we've picked up because this has happened. I've seen it. I've been in, in this ministry now over 60 years. You're supposed to say you don't look it. Okay. <laughs> don't offend me. <laughs> but, but offenses will come. And I've seen it. And I, I've seen brothers and sisters pick up the offense of somebody else. Say, that's not going to happen to you. We'll deal with that. And they get in on it. And before you know it, it it's a chain reaction. And we have to stop offenses happening in the church. It's the Lord, just, it was just recently, I just got this as one of the major problems. And the Lord says, as a result of offenses, then bitterness comes. And there is, it's such a powerful force, bitterness, because bitterness separates us from the purposes of God. And there is a verse that we have in Hebrews that, also came to me, and it says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause, uh, cause trouble, and by this many, get this, because many will be defiled. I've seen this operate. I, I, one stands out, one lady, because of her, of her hurt, she drew her family in and, and it turned into a, a root of bitterness. But fortunately, through prayer, we we're able to rescue the family. Now, if you talk to this lady, I knew her well enough, she'd say, I'd never want to do that. No, I wouldn't want to affect my children. I love my children. But she allowed it. And her, her family, in defense of mother, was going to stand by mother. We've got to stick by mother and protect her. And they got drawn in, and they picked this spirit up. And before you know, many are defiled, because it's a snowball effect. So from offense, you go into bitterness. Then bitterness gets stirred, and it turns into anger. And then we have a lot of angry people. I've seen them stomp out. Boy, I was, years ago, I was acting as a presbyter, and I was asked in Nova Scotia, it was in Halifax, and to go to another church. The church was absolutely divided, and one half of the church sat here, the other half sat over here. Absolutely divided, would not speak. Some were family members, and I said, Lord, what do I do? They asked me to come in to solve that problem. You might as well shake a mountain loose to try to handle that, but the Holy Ghost. All of a sudden, I stood trying to encourage them to reconcile. The spirit of prophecy came, and the Lord gave such a rebuke. If you do not, boy, he came down. What was going to happen? And I was trembling. The word was, it shook the place. That be, I, then all of a sudden, I watched. The group here ran over to this group. This group was running to this one. And they're falling on each other's shoulders, weeping and crying, and turned that whole situation around. One work of the Holy Ghost. And this is our salvation. It's not trying to counsel people. We have more counselors. Years ago, I didn't know anything about counselors. Now we've got all these counselors. And we do need some wise counsel, mind you. But why have we not counted on the Holy Ghost? It's His ministry. We need God to show up. If we would spend time in prayer and seeking God, we'd resolve a lot of problems that go on in churches today. How many here in the preacher? And so the root of bitterness, once it gets in, then it causes division. And that's what we see happening even among denominations and they turn one against another and one's better than somebody else. Listen, we're all blood-bought. There's no one, there's only one Lord, there's only one faith, there's only one baptism, there's only one Father over us all. There's only one Jesus, hallelujah. Let's glorify him. Sometimes we have to lay aside our preconceived ideas and break before God. God's looking for a brokenness in his people, a humility. And so if we want to see God do something, and you do, I know you do, uh, 
You, we say we love one another, like John in 1 John chapter 4, it's here as well, where they, um, you, a man say, I love God and hates his brother. He is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Is that in the Bible? I think we should take that out. I don't think it's very good. Huh? That's what they're doing. They don't like this verse. Here is John, the beloved, saying, "Say so you, you uh, love God and hate your brother? You're a liar. I said, I'll slap your face. You call me a liar. <laughs> but that's what they're afraid of. God wants some people in the pulpit that's not afraid yeah. of fear of favor. Lay it out. We're not going to get rid of sin. We're not going to get deal with issues like this that's hindering revival unless truth is proclaimed. That's right. We need to have this done. Praise God. This really shakes me up. But, and then we say we, we uh, love God and don't love your brother. John says, you're a liar. No one likes to be called a liar. What did you just call me? You know, we just say, well, I'll show you. And then all of a sudden we're offended and then we rise up. There is a brokenness, a tenderness that comes when you walk in the Spirit. Amen. You can tell what, how much flesh operates in you and how much spirit operates. I'm here to tell you there's so much flesh in the church today. Now, it, it's hard to, to admit it, but it's true. We've got so much flesh active, even from the pulpit. I've seen some demonstrations of flesh, and they tried to say it was the anointing. It was no anointing at all. It was they were upset and angry and they were going to land based somebody. Now, we speak the, uh, the truth in love. And you can't, if words fail you, then try tears. We have to move in the compassion of Christ. It's his church. And I, I was seeing this, and perhaps tomorrow morning we can share in this, the cry of the prayer of Jesus, what he's longing for, is that his people may be one. We're so divided. We've got this doctrine going and we've got this going. And this is so important. Forget all those doctrines. Come in spirit and brokenness. And let the Holy Spirit sort out which doctrine is good and which is not. And have to be willing to let it go and shake it loose and say, well, I thought it was right. There's sometimes I had to admit, well, I was hanging on to that. And it really wasn't what God wanted. Shake it off. Let's get free in the spirit for whom the Son sets free. We're free indeed. It's not the church, not the preacher. It's Jesus, the Son, that sets us free. And there is a freedom that God wants to bring to his church. So we need to deal with offense. The big thing right now I see, as the Holy Spirit gave me this a couple days ago, that the offenses will come. But how do we deal with the offenses? So real. There are some here that you've taken on offense of somebody else and you're going to help solve their problem. But why don't you let God do it? There's some that have been so wounded, you've been carrying a woundedness. I remember Faith Tabernacle years ago, and some of you may remember, we were, it's a Sunday night service, and I was just telling the pastor that today, that I was on the platform and, and I felt the Holy Spirit say, um, it was um, damaged emotions, two words. Pray for damaged emotions. Well, I said, I'm not a psychologist, Lord. Like, I don't understand this. Pray for people to get healed and all that. But I'm, I'm there on the platform, so I'm simple enough, hallelujah, to obey the Holy Spirit. So I got to the pulpit, and I said, the Holy Spirit just said to me now that there are those here with damaged emotions. That's all I said cries came out that shocked me all over there were different ones cry ah! i mean screams double over so i said what do i do lord like something started here i need help and so this this was just i just said come to the altar and they just came and poured out their hearts to god see the lord knows what's going on within us many of us had damaged emotions we've been crushed in family in marriages in circumstances had it, teachers at school, so many that, uh, you know, have been crushed over the years, and you've never really dealt with it. 
And it's a blockage to what God wants to do. Your heart cries out for God, but there's blockage within that's holding back the stream. The water, there's nothing wrong with the water. It's clear and crystal. But there's blockages that's got to be removed. Let us pray that God would remove this tonight. I, it, I, I'm checking myself. I have to check myself out. Uh, there was one that really, really crushed me um, in a situation that it was, you know, one thing to throw you down, another thing to stomp on you. I said, well, throw me down, but don't keep stepping on me. It, but, and so the Lord wanted to know my reaction. And I, I could decide to go into bitterness or to become better. And we have to decide either you become bitter or better with offense. And you decide it. And so when, in, in that moment, and I said, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, I want you to bless him. I said, I'll sure bless him, all right. You know, I was, I was prepared to bless him. And the Lord said, no, 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 bless him. You have to show kindness. You have to go the second mile with him. And I said, that's cruel. You asked me to do that, Lord. You know, that, that was a tough thing to, to have to, to bless somebody that you know that just beat the tar out of you emotionally. And you had to go and show love and bestow. And it wasn't long ago, I just saw that person. He came rushing over to me my sister, Norma Jean, we were at a meeting, and, um, and I wanted to know the reaction because I hadn't seen him for many months. And the Lord was just testing me, and he came up, and, and I was so sweet. I said, thank you, Jesus. I'm, I'm handling this better than I thought, you see. And, and, you know, this is the test that something will happen, what our reaction will be. I refuse to be bitter because bitterness will lead to that defiling of many. And I don't want to mess up my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. I bet you don't have great-grandchildren yet. Have you? One, I've got ten. That's one thing I'm beating you on. Well, but you're going to be way ahead soon. But can you imagine uh, living with that? But it is stopping what God wants to do in your life. How many want to be free? I want to be free. And I know that God's going to use you in what's happening here in Halifax and Nova Scotia, and even the Maritimes. And let us take a moment. I don't know what our time is. Well, it's not too late, is it? Yeah. Hallelujah. This is so good. I feel right at home. You're, this is living room. Isn't that good? No big structure, just being real. But I, I want to check my own spirit and say, is there any offense, Lord? Is there anything a deposit, because uh, the root of bitterness started with a seed. It didn't happen overnight. That was a strong root. It starts with a seed, and and I was there's that couch grass. You know what that kind of they call it couch grass. It is big and it just overpowers the lawn, and it it's lots of root to it, and then it spreads out. Well, I was taking the shovel because the whole bunch got in front of our our place. And I, I saw what those roots could do. And I had to go down with the shovel and pull that thing out and, and get the root. And I noticed a lot of little ones. And I said, that looks like those big ones. But there were little baby ones that looked so innocent. And I said, I'm going to get you one because you're going to turn to be a big one. You see, little things turn to be big if they're not dealt with. And that goes on in our lives. If you can deal with that as young people, deal with these things right now in your lives, don't, because surely offenses will come. As much as we don't like to think it, you're going to be offended maybe before the night's out. And you say, you know what? I love you. It just throws them when, you, when, when somebody offends you and you turn on them and say, you know, I love you. Oh, they they want to hit you then. They, don't. They, they want reaction. Some people say things because they're mean-spirited and they want to hurt you to get reaction. And you pour back love on them. They don't know what to do with love. Hallelujah. So you love one another. Let me just close this part. And I don't know if I mentioned this uh, when I was here in May, but a doctor passed away. Did I tell that story? A medical doctor passed away and his his colleagues resuscitated him. And he was a Christian doctor, and he came back to life, and he tells his experience with Jesus. He said, Jesus said to him, 
I want you to tell my people, my church, to read 1 John and study it to love one another. Get them to love one another. Now, I would have thought that Paul the Apostle had been a little offended, but maybe not in heaven. Because look at all what Paul taught. But Jesus emphasized 1 John, the epistles of John, dealing with love. He said, my people are not loving one another. Tell them. And then he said he saw the mother Mary standing with tears in her eyes and said, tell my people to only worship my son, to worship Jesus. She said, I am nothing. She was trying to let them know that they elevated her and they have in the Catholic Church now has been reported that they've elevated her over Jesus. And uh, and that just has been made known. Can you imagine? She was a sweet lady of God, but that's what she was, a handmaiden of the Lord. And now they have elevated her. These are the infiltrations. There's so many things coming into the church. We're, and and the, the other thing I was going to deal with was deception. A major threat to the church is deception. People who are picking up on what other people have said to be soundly the Word of God when it isn't the Word of God, and they're being deceived. You've got to walk in the Spirit. The sons of God are led by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God confirms the Word of God. And so you'll never go astray. You won't get radical. You won't get you know, off track if you keep in the Word of God. That's what's kept me over the years. I've never swung off in this doctrine or swung off in that. Been tempted because it seemed to be good. But we have so much going on today that's got in the church a prosperity. Um, I believe in God wants us to be prospered, but when that's your motivation and not the glory of God, the motivation for our lives is to glorify God. Did you hear it? The whole purpose of our living is to glorify God. And it may mean laying aside everything you desire and want to be, but in the end, you will glorify God. Hallelujah. So keep in the center of God's will by living in his word. This has been my passion, and I, I believe it's going to happen here. It's, so, it's such a sweet spirit of unity, and this is the thing that's going to release the glory of the Lord. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Don't you love that? Prepare you the way of the Lord. So this is what you're doing. And Sunday nights, I understand, you're coming together. May there, this place be filled with people from all different churches. Brother John, some of us said he's trying to start a church. He's not trying to start a church. He just wants to get the word of the Lord out. And it, there's a Sunday night, and, and they don't have church. Remember Sunday night was our big service? Yeah. Oh, that was Holy Ghost Sunday nights were the hot service. Now you can't get people out. They want to watch, used to be gun smoke, but <laughs> you know, that brands me from a hundred years ago. I don't know what's on there now because I never watched the, those Sunday night. I, I, somebody said, do you ever watch Ed Sullivan? I said, never saw him. They said, that's unbelievable. They said, every Sunday night, I said, I was in church every Sunday night as long as I remember. I can't remember when I wasn't carried in mother's arms or walked cradled in. From, uh, from a child, I never saw Ned Sullivan show. We were in church every Sunday night. That's no glory to us. That was a good, strong parent that took us out. But look what happened. All six serving God, generations after serving God. It pays to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. God will reward. So be encouraged. And so let's take a moment and just ask the Lord, first of all, Lord, is there anything of a residue? I don't know. Sometimes... Uh, I, I didn't know. I, the Lord put his finger on me. Can I share something else? It's all right to share heart. Because this, this was, I was, because of all of the hurt and devastation, I, I went, it, you know, sometimes it's subliminal. You don't really know it goes so deep in your subconscious. But I had a dream. I just went to bed. And usually my wife gets there before I do. But I, I got to bed and, and she heard this groaning coming out and and didn't know what it was and and I thought I woke up the whole house it was so loud and I saw myself 
uh, sitting in a chair there, and somebody was sitting here talking to me, and it was like a camera went over the shoulder of the person I was talking to and zoomed right into my face. And this is what they said. What are you going to do with your anger toward God? And I was shocked. And in that moment, I started to swing. I took on God. I just, in my dream, I was fighting, screaming loud. And, it, and I, I would have never in a million years if you'd have said, are you angry at God with all what you've gone through? I said, are you kidding? I'm afraid, first of all, to be angry at God. There's no reason to be angry with God. And yet the Holy Ghost knew that way down inside it was hidden in anger toward God. I would have never admitted it because my, my conscious mind could not accept it. But there was that, and I said, well, God, you'll have to help me. I began to weep. I said, I don't know how to even address this. I'm afraid of you, God, right now. Because I was afraid God's going to say, you little rascal, you're angry at me. I'll, you want me to squash you good? You know, I had to learn the father heart of God, which I never knew. I had a father that was very austere, a father that was very demanding. I, we only knew, now he was a very good man, greatly musician and uh, very gifted, but he wanted all his six children to be perfect. Well, we didn't disappoint him. Uh, <laughs> little humor. Uh, he, he just was that demanding. Now, we never knew if we did it uh, right because he never said anything. We knew when we didn't do it right. He got us and he said, you could have done better. Why did you do this? And, and he was a perfectionist. So in my whole life, I had to, to please father and long to hear him say, son, you know, that was good. You did. You played that trumpet well. You did well. You know, I really was pleased with it. Never, ever heard that. Only what, now what was that note you hit? What, you, you could have done better. And uh, he wanted to correct. Now that was his motivation. But it, that gave an image of God to me that, you know, Heavenly Father, you're likely never hardly pleased with me. I, you know, I'm so in the flesh. I, I wish I could be so angelic. Um, you know, so Father God, you must not be pleased with me very much. So I strived in spirit to please Heavenly Father, which I never felt I could do. And, and that embedded something within me. I was amazed when I was reading, and the Holy Spirit opened my eyes, when I was reading about Jesus being baptized in water, and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And I said, whoa, Jesus, you never did anything yet. You didn't start your ministry. You did nothing. And yet you have the Father saying, this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. And I, I, it broke me. And, I, and the Lord said to me, son, there's nothing you can do to make me to get you to love you more. It's nothing you have ever done for me that's caused me to love you. I love you because of who you are. Hallelujah. Know that. You're not loved by God because of your gifting, your talent, your, your preaching, your singing, whatever you do. That doesn't make God love you. He loves you because of who you are. He affirms who you are. And he says, because of the blood, you're my son, you're my daughter. I've chosen you even before the foundations of the world. So when I had to work these things, through, now I've been in ministry for years when all this is happening. What are you going to do with your anger toward God? Well, my natural thing was that I was flailing. My arms were flailing and I'm screaming. And I woke up and I said, oh no, the whole family is going to come running. They think I've lost it. And it wasn't. It was just in the deepness of that, that dream. But I had to say, Father, I do, not, I do not know what to do, how to handle this. So the Holy Spirit had to come. And so brought me in that moment into a relationship with Father. So I can truly say now, our Father, my Father, I love you, Father. Because I had loved Jesus, but I was afraid of Father. And it brought me into the heart of the Father. So bring, be brought into this, dear one. 
know how precious it is. So you may have something that the Holy Spirit will show. You've got an anger toward God because you, I felt God failed me. And he didn't. But I felt, Lord, you know, where were you? Where are you when this happened? Where were you, Lord, when I was a child? Where were you when I was going through all these things? The Lord said, I was there all the time. And he is. He's your loving father. Don't you love him? Hallelujah. Let's just take a moment and thank him. Father, we love you. Father, we love you. You're so precious, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, wonderful Jesus. Thank you, wonderful Lord. Holy Spirit, reveal to us, Lord, that which is going on even in our own lives personally. Remove any dross, remove any hindrance. We want to be free-flowing vessels that carry the glory of God. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Even in the silence of these moments, let the Holy Spirit search your heart. He will show you. You may be shocked. I had to have it in a dream to, to accept it. But let the Holy Spirit show you. Is there any residue? Is there anything within you that would be a hindrance to what God wants to bring you into? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Praise God. We give you praise, Lord. We praise God. I just worship you. Praise God. Oh, we're hearing Do you know the chorus? It's a sweep over my soul. Could you play it for me? Just let the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit, we honor the Holy Spirit. Not by our might or power, but by His Spirit. Glory to God. Yeah. Yeah. You can try that one up. You just get Brother Harry to play softly. Sweep over my soul, sweet Spirit. Sweep over my soul. We invite the Holy Spirit. This is, this is revival, saints. This is what releases... The glory of God. How many want the glory? We raised our hands and we want the glory. We not, we, you're going to have power, but we need the glory of God. Glory to God. Just play it softly. Sweep over my soul. Hallelujah. My rest is complete. Show us, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, sweet Spirit, sweep over my soul. Invite the Holy Spirit to come. Sweep over my soul, sweep over my soul, sweet spirit, sweep over my soul, my rest. Spirit, sweep over my soul. Oh, what an invitation. Sing it again, sweet spirit. Sweet all I need. Yes, amen. He is all I need. Amen. Jesus. Jesus is all I need.
Do you believe that tonight, that Jesus really is all we need? He is he's all I need. Sing, you're all I need. Yes, Make it personal. You're all, all that I need. Jesus. Jesus. You're all I need. Oh, yes, you are, Lord. Oh, yes, you're all I need. Hallelujah. Just play that softly. We won't sing. Just play it softly. How many would be open enough to say, I've got, I need prayer. We're all family here. I try to be transparent. It's in our transparency that freedom comes. That you say, I, I'm dealing with issues. I need help. Would you? Pray, perhaps that's been already freed up, but you may be one that's saying, I'm still needing this. I was many years in ministry when all this was awakened in me. It hasn't to do with your giftings or your position. It has to do with your heart. And God alone knows what's in our heart. And you, you feel you need some prayer. Just stand to your feet if you say, well, I, I'm trying to walk this through. I just need some prayer. Yeah, amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. That's it. Just stand. That's beautiful. Out of your own heart. Thank you, Lord. If anyone were to have said that to me, you've got anger against God. I would have said, how dare you say that? I've been in ministry so many years, I wouldn't have and put on this big religious air and not really deal with the real issue. But oh, when you break before God, that takes you into that which will bring you into the glory of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Yeah, just let the tears flow. Let, it's all part of the brokenness of your heart. Hallelujah. Just keep standing as the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Praise God. Because he, He'll take you down the path way back, some path. In even hidden areas that you were, would even be surprised. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise, Lord. This is the beginning of revival. This is how it begins. It begins in us. And then the Lord binds our hearts together. There's nothing that will block the flow of God. We're tearing down the dam that the waters may flow out. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. I'm just asking those, take a look of who's standing near you. If you just stand with them, we're just going to pray for them. There's one over here, over here. Could you have a couple of the sisters pray? Our sister here, our brother back here. Amen. Just let love flow from you to them. It's, it's, the love is healing love. His love is healing love. When I discovered the love of the Father, it brought such healing. Brought a new intimacy with the Father. Glory to God. Father, now we just pour your love into these precious ones. You know the woundedness. You know the pain. And your people, that's it. so beautiful to see you pray for one another. We just let love flow from our heart into yours because it's the love of the Father shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Father, let your love be so real. Let your love be so healing, Lord. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. It's been wonderful how the Lord's been bringing healing to you out of the woundedness what was meant to bring you harm and evil, God's turned it for good. And because the glory of God's on this, your life, brother. Hallelujah. Father, just restore 
to full glory. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. You're so precious, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We remove any barriers, Lord. Flow, let us flow in the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, so precious, so precious. There's just the sweetness of his presence. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Sister, God wants to restore to full measure. That's what he's called you unto. Amen. Don't listen to the, the ones that would say that which would be a barrier, a hindrance. Because God's stepping you forth. Amen. 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 To that destiny. Amen. We're not coming under any bondage. We're moving in the freedom of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You know the little chorus, Jesus loves me. Maybe a little lower key. Okay, if C. Jesus. Maybe C, key of C, C. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak. But he is strong. Sing it, yes. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, he does. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Why don't we all just stand together and just let that love flow in praise to him. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Sing it, yes. Jesus loves me, loves you. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Baba tells me so. I want you to sing it to somebody. Yes, Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus loves you. I do. <laughs> yes, Jesus loves you. Amen. Yes. Jesus loves you, the Bible tells me so. Hallelujah. Amen. Just take the hand of the person next to you. Let's just unite our hearts. Hallelujah. There's a sweetness of his presence. Glory to God. We're preparing the way, saints. This is preparing the way. We're getting the highway ready for the king. You, Hallelujah. A highway. Thank Glory you. to God. Shout it out, a highway. Praise Glory to God. A highway for the king. And the highway is prepared, then the glory will come. Hallelujah. Come on, we give you praise, Lord. We give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. 
Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Glory to glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Give F. Give F. Give F. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, I love you with give F. Oh, I love you in the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you in the love of the Lord. For I see him in you, the glory of thy King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. Sing it again. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. For I see it in you the glory of the King. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. Hallelujah. There's nothing like His love. Glory to God. Glory to God. Give Him praise in the house. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, if you want them here tomorrow morning at 10, I don't know if you can, it's fellowship time tomorrow morning. This is what relationships about. Isn't that great? No one high, no one low. We're all on the same level. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Cleansed by the same blood. Glory to God. God loves you. Give me a little higher key. Try G. God. Yeah. God. God loves you and I love, love you and that's the way, way it should, should be. Hallelujah. God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. Sing it again. God, God really loves, loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. Hallelujah. God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Praise God. And we even forget, have a seat for a moment. We're going to just give you a couple announcements and um, we're just going to get started. Pastor Ralph, come over here. Come over here. I mean, we're going we're gonna to take up an offering. So if we can yes. get the ushers ready. We want to bless him and over bless him. And for those that want to be part of his ministry. And uh, because, you know, I, I, I'm one of the persons that is against Pastor Ralph ministering outside of this country. Wow. Yeah. You know, as you know that I went, we talked last week about... The condition of the church, that there is a lot of hurting people in the church and not enough army to go on and, um, and meet their needs or be available to them. So as you know, I went to Cape Breton this past week, this past weekend, Friday and Saturday. And there were two situations there in Cape Breton. The mother called me about 10 days ago or so through a friend of mine there in uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia. And she said, my son is, I think he's demon-possessed. He hasn't talked to me for, for years. He took a dive in his life. Uh, he saw some dramatic staff uh, in, at his job, and then he gave up his job, and then he became a shut in. And he talks about legions, and he, and he put a... A uh, piece of cloth in the mirror. He doesn't want to look at himself. And the mo you know, when she said that, I said, I'll go and pray with them. I'll go and see the situation. 
Because that's a normal thing. When opportunities come to us as Christians, we have to take them. Because they didn't come to us by coincidence. Just like see that Del Hill came, just like other things come to, our, to, to us, we have to say, yes, Lord, here I am, send me. And we should be running to say yes. So, that, so, so somebody else doesn't do it. Amen? So, and then the, through that, through a friend here in the group, uh, I was connected with another fellow that had a problem with the law and everything like that. And he wanted to become a Christian. And he's from Halifax, but because of the problem that he's had for a season, for a time, he's in Sydney, Nova Scotia. So, and they didn't know that I was already planning to go to Cape Breton that weekend. I didn't go to Cape Breton for them first. I was already planning to go to Cape Breton. And then that's how we see the, the, the workings of the Spirit of God. That how he orchestrated all of this. So first we talked to the young fellow. And I even talked to the young fellow this afternoon. And uh, he's, uh, he's in Halifax. And tomorrow I'm going to be meeting with him again. Tomorrow he said he might pass by here today. But you know we led him in, into repentance. Not into ask Jesus in the hearts. So I say in order for you to have all of that God has. You have to turn around. And he says, what about accepting Jesus in my heart? He says, forget about accepting Jesus in your heart because many accept Jesus in their heart, but they continue to live the same way. The key for you is repentance. I say, when I first became a Christian, I went up to all my friends from the past and I said, no more. I went up to a fellow and I said, you know, I owe you money. He says, you, you better pay me. I say, I can. In order for me to pay you, I have to go back into that life. I have to do the bad things in order for me to pay you. I say, well, we can break your legs. I say, break my legs. I don't care, but I can't go into that life. They never came back to me. Others that owe me money, then I went back and I said to them, you don't owe me any more money. So I broke away. That's very important to break away from wrong influence in your life, no matter how tight you're with them because friendship with the world is an enemy of God right so and that's what I said to him and he said I'm doing it so um, we were going to probably see him when he gets back here and I connected him to a pastor there in uh, Sydney already we had a uh, we met him at a restaurant there in Sydney so uh, he has a connection there and he has us as a connection here. And then he told me that he was at a praying meeting. with uh, One of our praying meetings. About a year and a half ago. He said oh yeah I met you before you were doing a praying meeting. So I was really surprised. And I said great. So he's coming to the Lord on that. But what I wanted to get to. Is. This other situation. Going to a home. Knowing that maybe there's some demons you got to cast out. And. Or whatever, mental illness, all of that stuff. The lady came into uh, our meeting on, uh, on Friday where I was preaching. And you can see that she was just destroyed. But God came down, did a wonderful work there. And she left with a smile on her face. And I say, okay, I'm going to pass by your place. Um tomorrow after work before I go back to Halifax. So we're there praying and waiting for her and then we go into her place and um, and um, you know I, uh, you know we're walking with the Lord so we shouldn't be afraid of anything because you know when we step out no matter what problem it is uh, it doesn't matter. I mean God is inside of you facing whatever situation through you so no matter how big the situation may be God is always with you Jesus says lo I am with you right to the end I will never leave you nor forsake you nor fail you right so I mean I was confident I said Lord I am not Superman 
you know, Steve was with me. And I say, I'm not Superman. I don't have anything without you. So I had no fear, but I had peace. So as I went into the house there, the lady came in, and I went into the house, so I st- and, and I can hear in the, in the room the TV was really high and loud, and, um, and his name is Martin. So I pray with her first, committed the time to the Lord. Remember, this is a fellow that has been struggling with this for six years, He's been taken from Sydney, Nova Scotia, to the hospitals here twice, and the doctor sent him back home over there. He didn't have too much um, support from the body there in Sydney. And, um, and then I, uh, so I pray with her. We bow, whatever we had to do. But I felt some kind of peace about things. I didn't feel that we were there to cast out devils and all of these things and face the legions and whatever. And I mean, I was ready for that, but I didn't feel that. So after we finished praying, I start calling, you know, just like Lazarus came forth. So I said, Martin, come out. And, you know, I can overpower the, the television. It was very loud. So then I, he wasn't responding. So I walked over to the room. I said, can I walk over to his room? So yeah, sure, go walk over to the room. So I walked over to the room, and he was laying down on his bed with his face down. Remember, he has no relationship with his mother. He doesn't talk to anybody. He is chosen to be there for six years. The police has been called a few times because he can get aggressive with his mother. And I walked to his room and I said, Martin, this is Pastor John. I said, I'm here to talk to you. Come out. I want to say that. And then, you know, he didn't answer. So I was trying to find the button to turn the TV off. And I didn't. I said, Martin. And then, you know, he says to me, he speaks to me, and he says, please close the door. I'm trying to get some sleep. So, you know me, I like to, be, to give people a hard time. So I say, oh, okay, no problem. But, but you know, I'm here, you know, I want to speak with you. And I says, come out here. And, uh, and he says, please close the door. I'm trying to get some sleep. So I felt good because at least he was talking to me, right? And, 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 he, and, and he turned his face, and I was able to see his face. So he didn't look like he was a mean person or anything like that. He looked like just maybe gave up in life. And then the third time, and I knew that will get him upset the third time. I said, okay, and I don't know what I said. And he got out of his bed. Oh, I said, I hope he doesn't come and try to hit me or something like that. I mean, I feel sorry for him if he does. But anyway, not because I'm going to hit him, but because of the angels around me. So uh, he comes and looks at me, and he closes the door. So I said, okay. So I go back, and I sit down, trying to see what the Holy Spirit has. And as we are talking to the mother, I felt to pray. And, you know... We are all part of this miracle because there was a miracle. I asked you last week for all of you to pray as I went there. So we're all, this is not Brother John. This is none of us. This is all of us put together in what took place. So I felt to pray. I said, Donna, I think her name was Donna. I said, Donna, I said, what I want, and I said, we're going to pray about this, but I want you to pray That he will come to his senses. That he will realize that the life that he chose to be in is not in life. He's 39 years old. So all of this has started at 33 for six years. So and then we went and we started praying according to this. I said, Lord... Let him come to his senses. Remove the scales from his eyes and whatever. And um, 
And that was it. We pray. I left with a perfect peace. And I said to her, everything is going to be fine. And we left. And then the Spirit of God says, text her and see, because I was concerned maybe he told her off or, or maybe, um, or maybe uh, uh, got mad at her because uh, she brought us there. So I text her. I say, are you okay? Is everything fine? And I'll read her text. He says, for the first time, in over six years, for the first time in over six years, he hugged me. I mean, a real hug. He held on. I'm still in peaceful shock. Oh, thank you, Father. Let the healing begin in Jesus' name. I really don't know what to say. Words can express this balm of B-A-L-M to my heart. I thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit. And those he sends to bless. There is evangelism. There is evangelism. So, so we have to realize that as we go, no matter how big the problem is, he is the healer. He is the deliverer. He knows the man. But imagine a 39-year-old man that he came out of his room after we left. And he went and hugged his mother tight. So those are signs of the beginning of something wonderful. In their lives, pray for them. His name is Martin, and the, and the mother is uh, Donna. She's a single parent. And um, I won't give you details over the radio, but pray for them. Because God showed us that he's getting him out from where he's at. And the time to live is now for him and his mother and a year from now, he won't be the same fellow. He'll have an excellent relationship with his mom. And he'll be able to work and go and build a life and get married and have kids and be, live happily ever after until Jesus comes back. So, is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He knows the mind of everything. But I want us, you know, the thing that comes to my heart is this, is that uh, in, uh, I read last week Acts chapter 9 and verses 19 to 20 when, when he says that, that Paul's eyes, I mean, the, 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 it fell off. He was able to see. Immediately he, he, uh, he got baptized. We read in, uh, in uh, one of the scriptures in the book of Acts chapter 9. But in another one, he says that immediately he began to preach. Remember, he's coming from a life of what? Law. He was persecuting the church. He knew the law. He knew the Jewish traditions. He knew all of that. But he didn't know anything about the word of God in Christ. But as soon as he, as he got Saved in a way. As soon as he had an encounter with God in the road to Damascus, he became blind. And when they open up, his, when Jesus opened up his eyes through his servant, then his eyes fell off. He goes and get baptized. Who in the world told him about get baptized? But he must have seen Christians being baptized, and he must have overheard what baptism really meant. 
That means that he had to die to the old and embrace the new, the resurrection of Christ or something. He must have known something. Then, was that? John the Baptist, right? As he was persecuting the church. But then what caught my attention is that he says, immediately he started to preach. Imagine, he didn't have what we have today. He didn't have the Romans road. He didn't have the ABCs of evangelism. He didn't have uh, Bible college. He didn't have a school of discipleship as you have it right here. He had nothing like that. The only thing that he had, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He had all the knowledge of the old, all the knowledge of the law and all of that. But he was missing the part of the Holy Spirit. But the reason that immediately he began to preach is because someone took over his life. The person of the Holy Spirit. And as I mentioned, you see the disciples walked with Christ for three years. And they deserted him. They denied him. Remember that. And Paul becomes the greater man in the word of God. A lot of people want to be like Paul because most of the New Testament was for Paul. Paul never walked with Christ. Paul became great because he walked with the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul said, he says, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stand in front of you to give you eloquent words. I'm not going to stand here and try to impress you with all the knowledge that I have. He says, I'm going to stand in front of you with a demonstration of the one that has taken over my life. And that is a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Imagine that. And the reason that he became great is because who came in into his life? Christ by his spirit, the comforter. You see, a lot of us, you know, something came to mind on Friday. And is this. We all sing about the blood. We all sing about the name of Christ. We all sing about the power of the blood. We all sing about the Holy Ghost. We all sing about that and we all sing about this. But people today have not experienced it. We're all singing it. But many people have not experienced the power of the blood. Many people have not experienced the name of Jesus in action. Many people have not experienced the Holy Spirit. That communion that comes in a relationship with a third part of the Trinity. So you see, we have a lot of people singing, but they don't even know what they're singing. Well, I guess I'm going to sing it because somebody else is singing it. Because if we all knew what we were singing, we wouldn't be in the mess that we are as a church. Come on. Come on. Because if we knew the power of the blood... If we knew the power of the name of Jesus Christ. If we knew the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I tell you we will not be defending but we will be possessing the land. Then we will know that no weapon before us is impossible. No weapon they form against us shall prosper. We will know that. Then we will know that all power has been given unto us. And, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. We have power over all the power of the enemy. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But the Lord has spoken to me and he says, you know, there is a misery in the body. 
because many sing it, but they have never experienced it. You see, truth, a lot of people say there is power in truth. No. I know people that have read the book, the Bible, all their lives and still don't know Christ. Christians in the church today that go, whether it be Pentecostal church or whatever church they go, they sing about things, but they don't know Christ. They read the scriptures. Because let me tell you, power is not in knowing knowledge. It's not in knowledge. Power is in this truth with experience. God gave us the word to experience the word and we will never experience the word unless we apply the word. Come on. Are you with me today? You have this Argentinian look in you. You know, God, God wants us to experience his word. Oh, hallelujah. That when the devils come and all of that, you said, it is written. Amen. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Hallelujah. Thy staff and that rod, they comfort me. Greater is he that is in me. I am not a wimp. I am not a victim, but I'm a victor. And I believe with all my heart that, you know, in order for us to become what God wants us to become, we have to experience the word of God. We have to experience the word of God. And as we experience the word of God, then there will be a release of the spirit of God in us that will work through us to be able to say to that young lady and say, young lady, let's pray that the Holy Spirit will open up his eyes just like this Holy Spirit opened up the eyes of the prodigal son and he came to his senses to know that where he was was not the place to be. And then we walk away without without praying for him. We walk away without casting out any devils. We walk away from them, but the Holy Spirit did not walk away from him because somehow we quoted some scriptures and the Holy Spirit gave us the life to give because the words in the Spirit are life. So when we pray, we pray life into him. And I think that we pray life. I say, I pray life to that man. So what happened? We left, but the Holy Spirit stayed. And the Holy Spirit went into that room. So what happens then, somebody like myself, if that was my first time, then I will be just running like, a, I don't know, like a popcorn up and down here on the streets of, of uh, Halifax because of that miracle. That is a miracle that the Holy Spirit performed. Why? Because we step out in truth to experience the supernatural. As the truth is released, God releases his power. And that is for all of us. You see... As long as you believe the light of the devil, you'll never be able to be in the, in, in, in the life that God has created for you. A lot of Christians today, they believe in the lies of the devil more than they believe in the, in the truth of the word of God. That's the reason that we have become victims instead of victors. Because the devil comes and he says, you'll never accomplish anything. Look at your past. Look at your life. Look at the mess that you made in your life. He says, you know, you will never accomplish anything. And then we believe that. And then we go to church and we hear good words that we are more than conquerors. And there is power in the blood. And those things, you know, man, I wish I knew the power of the blood. Oh, I wish I, I, I you know, I, and we get desperate to, 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 uh, to receive a miracle from the Lord. We get desperate to receive something from the Lord because we are in need, but we don't know how to tap into that. 
And the way that we tap into that is to refuse the lies of the enemy and know this, that God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God chose the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. God is not looking for perfect beings. God is looking for open hearts that are perfect toward him that he might show himself as strong through them. So what you have to do tonight is this. You have to choose to walk out of this place with your head up as a victor. Put your past behind. Renounce all the lies that the devil has given you. And it says for the rest of my life, whether I have one ear or whether I have two ears, whether I have 10 ears or 20 years, I'm going to live the rest of my life as a victor, not as a victim. That's what we have to do. Because when we choose that, that is the beginning of activating the word of God in your life. Because you begin him to believe that you are more than conquerors through him that loves you. And if we're going to be disciples, we better be a people. Not only of knowledge... But knowledge with experience together, experiencing the power of God. When I went on the streets two weeks ago, man, I used to, I mean, people that know me in Toronto, he knew me in Toronto. Man, I was going there with a megaphone. I, I didn't, you know, but then we, we, we slow down or whatever we go through in life. And then the fire kind of goes you know, down and all of that. But two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when I went on the street, I was activated once again. And I said, God, now I know, now I see, you know, now I'm not going to look at my problems the way I saw them before. But now I know that you're going to use me no matter what my past was, no matter how, my, how many failures I did in my life. But Lord, I'm here now and you're going to use me. Hallelujah. And I believe that God wants to use you. The word of God for all of us tonight. God will use you for the rest of your life. But he cannot use you by believing the lies of the devil that you're not good. That your past doesn't match to what he has for your life. Prove life wrong. Prove life that God is real. Prove life that, 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 that God is a restoring God. That God will revive you. God will refresh you. God will review, re renew you. God will set you free that you're no longer bound to sin. You see, the reason that people get bound to sin is because they have knowledge. They have no experience. Because when you know that you pray something and God answers your prayer, that freaks me out. That day that I stood over here and one of my arms were shorter than others. And then Brother Justin came and prayed for me. As I saw it grow, that freaked me out. That was the first time that I ever seen God heal me. I seen God heal other people. But I never saw God heal me. So what happens now, I put, the Lord says, I want you to teach on, on, on healing. And I did. I obey. By his stripes I am healed. When I knew that my arm was shorter, I, I knew the word. I experienced the word because I seen people heal. So at least I have some faith in me. But then because of that experience, I was able to overcome. And that brought me to a different level in my Christian walk. So, stop living as a victim. Stop living as a wimp. Stop living as a coward. Because God doesn't make wimps or cowards. God makes victors. The devil makes wimps and cowards. We are the army of the Lord. He is the Lord of hosts. Who is my father? My father is Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Rafi. 
Jehovah Shalom. Who is my father? He's everything that I need him to be. Everything that I need, he is. I am covered. Amen. I am covered by who he is. Right? You have no reason to live as a victim. You have no reason to leave this place tonight. Remember, what you need tonight is an encounter with God. What you need tonight is to realize that, yes, I am living as a victim. But I'm going to change the course of my life. Somebody say, how to turn your life from defeat to, to victory. How long does it take? Seconds. It's just a change of mind, just like repentance is. It's just change your mind. It says, no, now I'm going to walk out of this place as a victor. I'm not going to listen to the lies of the devil. I'm going to listen to the word of God. And even if it takes a year for the word of God to come alive in the situation that I'm praying for, I'm going to stay there because in the year that I'm waiting, God is going to make me. God is going to build me up. God is going to fill me up. God is going to break me and mold me and fill me after his will. You have no reason to live as a victim any longer. God wants to set every single one of you free from being a victim to be a victor. And the only person that can put an obstacle to God is you. It's not the enemy. Because the Bible says that whoever you submit your members to, you become servants to. If you submit your members to the enemy, you become servants of the enemy. And he will make you and mold you after his will. But if you submit yourself unto God, to his word, no matter what it takes, and stand firm on the word of God... If it takes a year, listen, you have to understand revelation. Revelation is this. If it takes a year, that year is when God uses to mold you, to break you, to make you the person that you ought to be. Because God is not thinking about your situation today. God is thinking about what you're going to become tomorrow. And that's where we fail. You see, we look at a piano that is old. God doesn't look at the piano old. God looks at a piano restored, bright new, shining, singing praises unto him. That's the way he sees you. He never saved you, you know. The song that we sing, he did not bring us out this far to take us back again. But he brought us out this far to take us into the promised land. You see, our vision is limited because we haven't experienced the word of God. Moses did. He says, I chose rather to be mistreated with God's people than to live a sinful life here on earth. He had the revelation that whatever, if he chose sin, it will be temporal. He had a vision beyond. What you need in your situation is a vision beyond. God said, he says, let him that glory, glory in this. That he knows me. And understands me. You see, many people know about God. And some even know God. But a lot of people don't understand God. Because when you understand God and you face a situation. Then you know that God is a God of purpose. I took a plane over to see my son. Last month or whenever it was. I, got, I won't give you details because it's none of your business. But as I arrived to the airport, he didn't pick me up. He didn't pick me up. I knew that there was something wrong. 
The wife calls me and says, I feel so bad for you, John, for the situation that you're in right now. And I said to her, there is a purpose. Because God is a God of purpose. You see, people that do know their God, they will do great exploits. People that do know their God and understand God, they will have insight into the heart of God. You see, that's why our goal as Christians should not be money, should not be fame, should not be how great we can be in this world. It should be two things, and that is loving him and demonstrating our love to him by the way we live our lives here on earth. Because to us should be Christ. We have to live like that. God is a God of purpose. So I'm going to prophesy to you. The situation that you're in right now has a purpose. And God wants you to take your hands off that. And God doesn't want you to concentrate on the deliverance of or the healing or whatever of that purpose. God wants you to concentrate on the outcome of that purpose according to. To the word of God. Not what the doctors say. Not what people say. Not what anybody says. Because whose report are we going to believe? God's report. God's report. God's report. God is a God of purpose. I'll repeat it again. When I came to Nova Scotia. I went to Cape Breton for two years. After my thing was over over there, God has put something in my heart to stay here in the province. I share this with you, some of you, but I have to share it. My family fought me. They wanted to go back to, to Toronto. And I said, no. I don't know why God wants me to stay here, but I'm going to find out. And I say, if I feel this in my heart, God has a purpose. And that's how I ended up in this, in this province. I did, not, I did not end up in this province because I love this province, which I do. But that was not the reason of me being here. The reason of me being here was that I knew that there was a purpose. There was a purpose in me being here and God had to fulfill that purpose. God has a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for our lives. But when we miss it, it's when we get ourselves off focus. Oh, hallelujah. So every time that you face a situation, say, God has a purpose. Because the moment that, the moment that you say that, that means that God now is free to show you the direction or prepare your heart for that situation. If it's sin, then you're going to suffer the consequences. But if you live an upright to God, if you live a holy life and you want him to be everything to you and there is an obstacle in your life, that obstacle has a purpose. That's why Paul says, I count it all joy when I fall into divers temptation, knowing this, that the trying of my faith worketh patience, and let patience have a perfect work in me that I may come to the place of wanting nothing. He knew that every situation in his life had a purpose and he knew that every purpose had a revelation because he said knowing this there was a revelation in that purpose so he didn't have knowledge only he had experience because when you have experience then you can say there is a purpose how are you doing i'm doing terribly but there is a purpose I can't see the way out of this, but there is a purpose. I don't know how God is going to get me out, but God has a purpose. I don't know how I'm going to make it through that, that door, but God has a purpose. You see, we are people of purpose. 
God is a God of purpose. So God gives us situations. You see, it's not through the violets and roses that we grow. It's through the hard times and the hell in our lives that we grow. God never say it's going to be violets and roses until I come. No, he says you'll be persecuted, you'll be hated, you'll go through trials. He said, but don't worry, I have overcome the world. Don't worry, I am with you right to the end. Amen? So it's up to us tonight. It's up to us tonight to walk out of this place and kick the devils out of your home. Kick the devils out of your mind. Kick the devils out of your business. Kick the devils out of your marriage. Kick the devils out of your relationship. Kick the devils out of your young people. Kick the devils out of your sons and daughters and grandchildren. Kick the devils out of them. And I said, devil, enough is enough. Yeah, this is it. I had enough in the name of Jesus. Get out of my life. Get away from my family. Get away from my situation. God has a purpose. And some of you are saying, I'm going through sin. God has a purpose. The Bible says that he will teach us how to hate evil. How in the world he's going to teach us how to hate evil? You got to see the evil inside of you. And then he's going to make you hate the evil inside of you. And once you hate it with a passion, then he'll set you free. Is when you embrace the sin inside of you. That you lose and you prolong your healing and your deliverance. Then you'll be like just like all the other Christians. That they live, they live, they're in church for years and yet they have not grown. Listen to this. The moment the Lord places an obstacle in your life or a situation that he requires for you to change. And you don't change. You stop growing. You say, I'm not going to deal with this. I'm going to deal with that. No. I'm going to deal with, no. You have to deal with this situation in your life. In order for this situation to take you to the next situation. But if we say no to that, we stop growing. That's why we see people in our churches that were baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. And now they're being baptized by vinegar. There is no life in them. There is nothing. Why? Because at some point in their life, they disobey God and they stop growing. God was requiring more from them and they said not to God. And that's when the school stopped. You see, the purposes of God is for us to grow from glory to glory. The purpose of God is not for us to go from defeat to defeat or for us to go from one side to another and stop there. The Lord always wants to progress in you. I thank God every day that he never gave up on me. I thank God every day that through my failures, I was telling the people on Friday, they say, I have failed God a thousand times. I have obeyed God a thousand times. But I thank God that I'm still standing for the Lord. I thank God that his mercy endureth forever. I thank God that through those times, the good times and the bad times of my life, God was preparing me for the future. And I, you know, those are the words of Pastor Ralph. Many years ago, I was, I was going through a hard time. And Pastor Ralph says to me, he says, John... God or life is preparing you for what's ahead. And through the 30 years after he spoke that into my life, every time I went through something, I hear his words. God or life is preparing you for what's ahead. So then our focus must not be in what we go through. Our focus must be in the outcome of what you're going through. And if you don't see the outcome, 
trust who holds the future. Trust who holds the future. You see, the outcome hardly is revealed prior to when you should know because if it's revealed, we will spoil it. God has a timing. God has a timing. He will make all things beautiful in his time. So what you have to do, if you don't, I don't see the outcome, but I go away and the Lord starts sharing some big things. So it was time for me to know. Three years ago when we started praying and interceding and all of that and people will come. Oh, Pastor John, more people should be here. I said, brother, we are called to obey. I didn't see no signs. I didn't know that I will have a voice on the radio. I didn't know that I will go to see the Dale Hill. I didn't know that I will be having a school of discipleship. I didn't know all of these things. But I was trusting the outcome. I was trusting God for the outcome. Because I knew the word that he said. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. I knew that the word says be not weary in well doing for in God's timing you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. And you say Pastor John you don't know what I go through. You want me to download everything? Have a son that had a schizophrenia for six years not able to talk? Have my father die? Go into a trial for eight years when I didn't hear the voice of God. I had the word of God, but I didn't have the relationship that I had. God shut himself up in my life. Wanted to commit suicide 12 times. Visit the place that I will kill myself. I said, I'll hang myself here. I'll drive my car into the lake here. I'll, I, I'll jump in this water over here. I don't know how to swim very good, so I'll, I'll kill myself there, and I'll kill myself there, and i kill myself there. I visit all the places. And the spirit of suicide will be so strong against my life. And then it will disappear. Because deep down, I knew there was a purpose. Deep down, I knew there was a purpose. But there were times that we listened to the voice of the enemy. And we say, oh, life will be better without me. Look what I'm putting my family through. Look what I'm putting myself through. That's the light of the pit of hell. Because when you have those thoughts, listen to this. When you have your thoughts, those thoughts are a sign that you are in the hands of the Lord. Those thoughts don't come because you're in his hands. Those thoughts come because you're in God's hands. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, God tonight will give us an encounter. And it's not an encounter of fireworks and stuff like that. The encounter is, I give you Jesus. And just like I left that home, the Holy Spirit will be with you and go, go with you and accomplish that we have spoken tonight. You will no longer be a victim. Say that with me. I will not be a victim any longer. I'm a victor. I'm a victor. Amen. Say, I renounce the powers of darkness in the name of Jesus. 
I cast them out. Out of my mind. Out of my life. Out of my business. Out of my family. In the name of Jesus. I'm a child of God. God doesn't make junk. God restores junks. And makes them beautiful. For his kingdom. For his glory. In the name of Jesus. I declare war. Against the devil's war. In the name of Jesus. And I push him back. In Jesus name. I am no longer. In the defensive. But I now. Position myself. In the offensive. In the name of Jesus. I'm a child of God. I'm not from this kingdom. I'm from the kingdom of God. I am an alien to this world. I belong to Jesus. And Jesus will, lives in me. Oh my God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's so good. God is so good. God is so good. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you. I praise you. I, I magnify your name. Holy Spirit, you are mighty. You are powerful. You are, you are wonderful. You are wonderful. Revolutionize our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Restore us tonight. Lord, that we will not think that we're war, uh, pew warmers. Those that go to church used to warm up the pews, give our tithe or offer or whatever we do. And there's another day we did our job. No, Lord. Revive us. Revolutionize us. Make us believe what we have never believed. Make us believe that we are indeed more than conquerors through him that loves us. Oh God, make us believe and experience the word of God as we have never experienced it before. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I break every chain, every fetter, every bond upon your lives, upon your homes, upon your bodies. In the name of Jesus Christ. I break every curse, every generation curse in the name of Jesus Christ. I come against every cancer cell. I come against every, every sickness. I come against every pain in the name of Jesus Christ. Sin brought. Pain, sin brought sickness. But Jesus Christ came, shed his blood to forgive mankind of their sins. Wipe us afresh, forgiven. Now as sickness and devils have walked in with that authority of sin. Now we kicked it out. By his stripes, we were healed. By his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Devil, every sickness, every attack of the enemy that you have brought upon our minds, upon our homes, upon our families, upon our business, upon us spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially, whatever way, right now, devil, get out in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. For we have power over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be any mean hurt us. You're defeated, devil, in the name of Jesus. And right now, Father, release your anointing upon our lives right now. The anointing that gives us the ability to do what you call us to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
release your anointing upon our lives. The anointing that gives us the ability to accomplish the purposes of God for our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Let your word go forth tonight and accomplish that which you desire. Demolish all the power of sin in our lives. Demolish every negativity in our lives. I come against every spirit of suicide, every spirit of lies, deception, in the name of Jesus Christ. And baptize us with the Holy Ghost and fire, the true fire of Almighty God. In the name of Jesus, I break the powers of witchcraft upon our lives. And Lord, as you open the eyes of Martin, I pray that you will open up our eyes tonight. Open up the areas that we're blind of, that we may fully see our condition, the condition of this world. And what we need to do for you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you Lord. Amen.